Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm Charlotte Renault. I, I will be the, moder the moderator for this session on capacity calculation. I work for Euroelectric. Euroelectric is the Brussels-based organization representing the interest of the electricity industry at pan-European level. And uh, I'm working in particular on retail and market uh, issues. Um, on wholesale and retail market issues, sorry. So I'm very happy to, to I would like to thank the organizers, uh, Nordic RSC, the affiliated TSOs, and of course NSOE for the kind invitation and the opportunity given. I think the topic of capacity calculation is key. Indeed, effective um, market integration rely on coordinated, coherent capacity calculation. And in this regard, the role of RSC and the future RCC will be instrumental in this, uh, in this perspective. So this is what we will discuss right now. So let me invite uh, the panelists for this uh, session. So we have Anne Vadash Nielsen. Anne is a Director General at the Swedish Energy Market Inspe Inspectorate. We have Elaine O'Connell. She is policy expert on electricity market at the European Commission, DG Energy. We have Soren Dupont Christensen, who is a CEO of Energinat and board member of NSOE. We have Jens Moller Birkenbeck, manager at Nordic RSC. And then last but not least, we have Martin Ulander, system business architect of uh, Zventa, Zventka Krefnat. So yeah, let's give a round of applause for our <laughs> panelists. So the session, as I said, the, the topic is very interesting and there is a lot to discuss. We have only 15 minutes to do that. So I suggest that we use our time uh, optimally. We'll start with a 10 minute presentation by Martin, who will explain us, who will have the challenge to explain us what is capacity calculation about in simple terms and uh, explain also the status of implementation of the uh, capacity calculation uh, projects in the Nordic region and then we will move on with the, with the panel debate to understand better the regulatory framework around this capacity calculation, the changes that have been brought by the clean energy package and the electricity regulation, and how this will uh, affect TSOs, RSCs, and future RCC processes. So thank you everyone, and let's get started. Yes, I got the question some time ago if I could do this in 20 minutes and I thought that was a challenge. So now I got asked to do it in 10 minutes. Yeah. Uh, but I will try to very briefly explain what the capacity calculations and essentially flow-based is all about and uh, very short bits about what we're doing in the Nordics and, and where we're at. Uh, and I made this picture and I think it fits quite well. I think it was someone in the morning the panel that said the market is the, is the, is the driver of the system while the, the, the power system is the servant. And I think this is a quite a good analogy, if you do agree with that. And if you move it to a sort of a physical analogy instead that the, the market is the driver, you can see the system as the vehicle. And, and, the, and I would like to ex explain that the capacities is the the capacity in essence of the vehicle. It, it is a physical system that, um, so the, where the capacities can act as a layer in between the market, the, the, the driver of the system, so to speak. And uh, why do we have to do these restrictions? Well, it is a physical system. It, it has physical limitations on, on how much we can transfer, uh, how much power we can transfer in the system. And uh, of course, uh, the market can trade over these capacities. There are other means to ensure system security, but to have a well-functioning overall power system would need to, need to be in line both with, within the physics and the market. Uh, this, the system operator unfortunately lives in the physical world where it's quite a complicated task to monitor system security, of course. It's first and foremost, it's not linear which the market is. And we have a, a quite detailed modeling of our power system we, we, that we need to, in order to ensure system security. And what the market instead needs is, is a simplification of this world, firstly a linear. But there are different degrees of simplifications. And on the, on the one hand side, the most simp simple way of, of describing exchange capacities is the NTC, the net transfer capacities. And 
on the intermediate way is the flow-based capacities. So you can see this on a very high level that capacity calculation is the way of translating the complex nonlinear world into a simplified linear world. And what the market operator does with, us in, with using these capacities or market constraints as input is of course aligning buying and selling bids and performing a market allocation or an optimization of this whilst constraining the, the, the physical constraints provided by the, the system operators. And the outcome of this market allocation is the prices and net positions. And from these you can derive scheduled flows or exchange flows. Now we're going to get a bit more technical. Uh, so this picture attempts to explain the difference between flow-based and NTC. The, the, this is the Nordic system with, with their bidding zones, and the yellow arrows indicates a bilateral exchange between two bidding zones. And in, in an NTC world, there's a commercial flow that is the light blue arrow only between those, these two uh, bidding zones. And this is what is seen by an NTC uh, allocation. But in the flow-based allocation and also in reality, the, the flow takes a very diverged path. Not, not uh, the entire trade takes a direct path. In this example, it's 56%. I forget to look here. Uh, only 56% takes the actual commercial path of that trade. And this is physics. This, this is not something made up by TSOs. It's just physics. And uh, but, but what Flowbase does is simply to try to put this also in the linearized model. It's still a simplification, but we try to make it a little bit more close to the reality of what, what that trade actually entails for the power system. And it's also shown in the matrix uh, for the Nordic system, and this is just for one hour, how, how the, the, each trade will impact the flows between the different bidding zones. And you can see it's not it's quite interconnected, or another word for that is meshed in, in the Nordics. Uh, and this is, again, a quite a complicated picture. I'm sorry for the colors. Uh, this is an attempt at explaining why we need to reduce uh, the physical capacities in an NTC world, why we cannot provide phys the full physical capacity in an NTC world and, and in a meshed grid. In the left-hand side example is where we try to do this, and this is an example of three bidding zones and three interconnectors in between with all the, physical, all the same physical capacity of 1,000 megawatts. Uh, and if we do provide the physical capacity, that means 1,000 megawatts from, on each interconnector. Uh, in an NTC world where there's no uh, uh, flows, uh, no knowledge of the actual physics behind this, there is a possibility of a trade between bidding zone A and C, in this case, of a 2,000 megawatt. Because bidding zone A can export first 1,000 megawatts to, to C and 1,000 megawatts to B. And of course, the similar for, for bidding zone C. And as the, there is a physics behind this, not all the, the exchange will take that path, as, as seen in the example, but rather uh, some of it will take the long the distance path and this will cause an overload in the A to C connector. Uh, so what we as a system operator has to do uh, in order to provide system security is to reduce the capacities. We cannot provide the full physical capacity to the, to the market in the NTC world. And this reduction is in this example done uh, to 750 megawatts on each interconnector, but it can in essence be done in an unlimited or uh, infinite number of ways. This is just one example of how it can be achieved in this example. And it also leads to uh, an inefficient system in, 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 since we cannot uh, fully know where the capacities will be needed tomorrow. But what we do in flow-based instead is that we provide not only the physical capacities between on, on the interconnectors or on, on the lines, but we also say how much a trade between each bidding zone affects each, each interconnector. And it's quite small, but it's the PTDF percentage value. So, so that's the linearization part that we still, we provide a sort of a grid model, 
but we do explain how the, the trades induce flows on, on, on the different uh, connectors in the grid. And this slide is just an introduction to some of the terminology in flow base. The PTDF is a power transfer distribution factor. And that is the actual percentage of the flow that is induced by a trade. And a, a monitored element, or in this uh, flow-based world and, and the regulation, it's called a critical network element. These are the elements that actually are considered in the flow-based. Uh, and the actual physical maximum flow is called Fmax. And what this in the end does is we, pr we provide, instead of just being limited bilateral trades, we provide a simplified grid model to, to the market allocation. So what happens when we, when we do a trade here, the market actually knows. If, we, if a trade between over 100 megawatts between A and C, the market allocation algorithm is aware of what this, how much flow this induces on each branch. And it also knows the, the upper limit or the margin available for trade. So to go back to this matrix where we showed flow-based and interconnectivity, this is what the real world looks like, and this is what the market will see in, in the flow-based world. But on the left-hand side is what the market sees in a CNTC world, that the, or, or NTC to simplify, that each trade only affects the, the flow between two bidding zones. And I think this is a pedagogy slide, if you understand it. Um, Something about uh, what were the process in the Nordics um, today, before we have implemented this, we are four different TSOs. We have four different ways of calculating capacities. And we provide them all to one NEMO in the form of NTC values. And what we will do tomorrow is we will implement an, a, a coordinated methodology and introduce the coordinated capacity calculator to actually perform this methodology. And the TSOs will, of course, provide inputs to these calculations. And the inputs is um, primarily, of course, the IGMs, which produce the CGM to do these calculations. And uh, in the Nordics, we have uh, chosen to go for flow-based, both for day-ahead and intraday markets. But we will have a CNTC as an interim intraday methodology. Uh, and for the long term, it's uh, still yet not decided by Acer. And if this is not complicated enough, we are also at the same time, more or less, uh, introducing multiple NEMOs in the Nordics. We are no longer only dealing with one NEMO. And uh, currently we have three NEMOs. So something about the actual implementation is, it's not only about developing a methodology and mathematics and then go out and procure an IT system that can perform this, but it's actually a quite a complex cooperation between the four TSOs and, and the Nordic RSE here in Copenhagen, where we have to, to develop business processes because everything is new for us. We haven't done this before. Uh, and of course, we have to develop the IT system. It's not to be forgotten, but it's not the only part we're doing. And still, there are harmonization issues left to be done in the Nordics. We have a common methodology, but there are a lot of details that needs to be sorted out. And the process we are in today is that we have signed a, an IT vendor and we are just in the, in the finalization of the first design phase where we will see multiple iterations of, of the implementation. And uh, we will start a parallel run that shall continue for 12 months and that's six more months than C CACM in the Nordics before we will go live with, with the flow based for day ahead and CNTC for intraday. I think I made it in 10 minutes, but I don't know if it was understandable. <laughs> indeed, thanks a lot, Martin, for this very good overview. And you made it indeed in time, so maybe we have time for one or two questions, if there are any questions to Martin on his, uh, on his presentation. Ah, one question there.
Yes, of course. Uh, but by simple, I mean it's a simple uh, uh, way of describing the, the actual constraints for the market algorithm. It's not simple in the terms of calculating them for the, the system operator. Uh, because, because of these, uh, the three node systems I showed you, there, there are an infinite number of solutions to the NTC problem. And when you, when you have a mesh system as a system operator, you, you have to basically guess where the capacities will be mostly needed by the market in order to align and create your NTC domain. This you don't have to do in a flow based. You basically, you, you tell the market what, what is possible and the market will decide where it's needed. This is not the case in NTC to a full, full extent. Any, any other question? No. If not, uh, thanks again, Martin, for this very good overview and also state of play of implementation of flow base in the Nordic region. Um, maybe let's, uh, let me start this, uh, this panel by um, asking a question to Elaine from, uh, from, the, from the European Commission, from DG Energy. So we had this very good introduction by, uh, by, um, by Martin on yeah, the more technical side. Would you be able to maybe complement this picture with the EU regulatory framework for capacity calculation so that we have the, the complete overview? Is it on? Yeah, here we go. Um, thanks very much for the question. Um, indeed, as you can see from the slides, this is quite a complex technical world that, that we're in. Um, but I think it's worthwhile to maybe take a step back and say, well, why are, why are we in this world? How did we end up with this, um, these complex regulatory processes and these complex cross-border calculations? And this came from back in the, during the implementation of the third energy package where more coordination and more um, cross-border calculations were needed between TSOs. And so this, this is the idea behind the initial network codes and guidelines. What areas of cooperation are needed by TSOs? Where do we need to work together in a more coordinated way? And how should we do that? In what particular areas are these? So that was how we came up with the the, net, the guideline on capacity allocation and congestion management on the system operation guideline. It was really because there was this need that was identified by the TSOs of areas that we need to work together. Um, it was also seen that this would improve efficiencies on how we use our network and how we, we calculate the capacities and how we use it for the market. Um, and of course then, by more efficiently using the network, you also reduce the cost to consumers. So yes, we're in a complex world, um, but that's also because the issues that we're trying to tackle are cross-border and they're, they're complex by nature. Um, so in terms of the, the clean energy package then, and where does all of this fit together with the network codes, um, we're still of course implementing the network codes and that's really a key priority for us. Um, the, we heard a lot today about the system operation guideline and how that will interact with the new regional coordination centres. And we also heard a lot about this ongoing um, implementation of the CACM guideline and how that will interact with the, the new 70% trading target, which we'll come back to later. Um, I think the clean energy package was really trying to lift some of the key principles um, and some of the, the learnings that we had from the network codes and guidelines and put them to the level of secondary legislation. So, for example, with the system operation guideline, what started off as a voluntary coordination between um, TSOs through the RSCIs, and then that, big, that was a best practice that was rolled out around Europe under the system operation guideline. And then we were building on that framework within the clean energy package, so adding new areas of cooperation, but again, ones that have been identified as things that will be useful to help us meet the challenges of the energy transition and the, the mesh nature of, of the grid. And I think in terms then of maybe CACM, we were also building on, on what we learned from the implementation of CACM. So certain issues around, around governance and issues around the principles, making sure that clear principles are enshrined as well in EU legislation. So I would say that the clean energy package builds on what we have already and really tries to learn the lessons as well of all of our experience um, through, the, through, through the process of implementing the network codes. I'm happy to go into more details on other specific elements later. Thanks a lot, Elaine. I don't know if, Anne, you have uh, anything to, to add on that uh, from an uh, NRA regulatory perspective? Yeah. Yes, but then you have to open the mic. 
Okay, I opened it. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Yes, I can uh, agree a lot with what Helen said. Uh, effective use of the existing uh, networks is, uh, of course, of utmost importance. Not only, of course, because it reduces cost, but but also because we we need to do that in order to cope with more renewables coming in, and especially to to utilize the existing interconnectors is extremely important. I would say. Um, and, I mean, we really welcome the methodologies uh, stemming from the CSEM, uh, both on, on day ahead and intraday, and, and the forwards market. Uh, I think this, those methodologies will bring about more efficiency. Uh, it looks like they are more complex, <laughs> at least from <laughs> Martin's presentation. Uh, but uh, we also actually believe that they strengthen uh, transparency, because transparency and access to... Uh, to information, correct information, is vital for the market, uh, well-functioning markets, and it's also vital for, for I mean, both in short-term uh, signals to, to uh, stakeholders, but also if you think long-term, for uh, long-term investments, this is really, really important. Um, I think that the parallel runs in the Nordics will give also uh, maybe some reassurance, hopefully, for stakeholders that maybe think that this is very complex and they have maybe are, are hiding something, the TSOs here. Uh, so hopefully this will be um, a good way to, to implement this, this in the best possible way. And we as NRAs will of course monitor. Uh, the TSOs will report the flow-based parameters to us. So this will be um, interesting times. Uh, although I've, I, I, uh, I think we should have implemented it already, but I understand it's really complex and a lot of IT. But uh, but still, this is uh, good news, I think, for the Nordics, and uh, yeah. Thanks a lot, and um, maybe to uh, to give the opportunity to to Jens or, or Martin, if you want to to complement to, to 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 speak a bit more about this ongoing process for uh, implementation of flow base in the Nordic region. Um, indeed, it's a very complex project uh, with a lot of IT complexities. Did you uh, did you have like uh, lessons learned from from the experience in the core? region, the implementation of the flow base in the core region, and does it help uh, for, for the, the implementation here of, of flow base in the Nordics? So the, the short answer is yes. Okay. It helps. Okay. Is that, uh, I think it works. Yeah. Um, but but uh, having said that, there are differences between the Nordic uh, power system and, and the continental power system. And that's basically what we are building into the methodology uh, in the Nordic area, um, which is then taking these differences into account and making a, in theory, simple, same uh, flow-based calculation, but in detail quite different, because we take advantage of a lot more parameters because otherwise the Nordic system will not be able to, say, operate. So, um, we have a uh, clear target in the Nordic RSC, and that is to make uh, things as simple as possible, but not more simple. And in this case, it, it is not so simple. So that's the point one on the flow-based. And then the other thing is, and that I think is the sort of really major breakthrough, uh, you mentioned that, uh, this will be moving our calculation from the expert-based calculation methodology that has been used extensively amongst all TSOs uh, in history uh, to a data-based uh, methodology. But the say, uh, criteria for being able to do that, of course, is that we have a solid uh, data model and that we are building uh, at the same time. So I wouldn't say that uh, say adds to the complexity necessarily of the flow-based capacity calculation, but uh, it really is a heavy journey because we cannot exactly judge whether it's the data model that is the good one or the bad one, or it's the tool, or maybe uh, the algorithm that are, say, uh, creating uh, the difficulties. So that's what we're working with, but uh, we are on the, the track, um, and uh, we're struggling with that, and uh, we have a 
plan for going into parallel op operation with the flow-based capacity al uh, allocation, as you mentioned, uh, by next summer. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for this uh, this perspective. Um, so we mentioned that def definitely it's a very complex project, but will that will definitely bring more more transparency. So it gives maybe uh, um, opens the floor to the to the next discussion. Uh, of course, there has been uh, concerns expressed by uh, by some st stakeholders on uh, the transparency in the way uh, capacity calculation is sometimes performed by by TSOs or or RSCs, and in particular, I think that Acer. Uh, has been quite vocal on that, uh, in particular in its latest editions of the market monitoring report. So, would be uh, and other stakeholders have also been uh, vocal on that. So, I, I would be interested maybe to understand the perspective of, of Soren on, on that. How do you? What's the view of, of the TSOs and and so in in general on on this transparency transparency issue in capacity calculation? Do you? How do you see the the CP provisions maybe helping helping this and? Um, yeah, that will be, and and also whether stakeholders can help help further in this uh, in this direction. Yeah, I I think my first point uh, that I prepared for 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 this was to say that uh, it was very complex to do this uh, flow based, but I think Martin destroyed that because it was so uh, crisp and clear and simple when he explained it in his presentation. So I think uh, indeed we have the first degree of transparency there. Uh, but, but having said that, um, I think we have achieved a lot more transparency and capacity calculation in the recent years. I think as, as Jens mentioned, we, we went from uh, expert-based to data-based uh, capacity calculation and I think that's the first step. I think that uh, CWE with the operational uh, flow-based uh, that they have, they are already uh, quite advanced in providing, uh, providing data and uh, making that transparent to stakeholders. I think when discussing sometimes with stakeholders, and I think it's good to have the input uh, from them as well, that they want even more transparency, sometimes it sounds a little bit to me like they want simplicity. And um, honestly, I don't think we can provide that. Uh, because I think Martin also touched on, on this in his presentation, that um, what we are doing now with this capacity calculation is actually all the hassle that we as TSOs have uh, in operating the grid, we make that very transparent and visible to the market. Uh, so that is a lot of complexity and uh, you need to get up early in the morning perhaps uh, to really digest all the data. Uh, but uh, we will be committed to gradually increase the transparency in, in the data from uh, the TSO side. I think uh, regarding this 70% uh, uh, famous or, uh, or what we should call it, uh, we are currently cooperating intensively with ASA on the data provision uh, on, uh, on how to, uh, to really get a, a, a database discussion on that. I think there has been too much, uh, too much uh, not data-based discussion on it and I look forward to, uh, to providing really a fact-based uh, discussion on that. Um, I think also here it's, uh, and I think also just to, to repeat the point from Jens, we have some uh, regional differences here, which means that we will not uh, do this completely harmonized. And I think this also is expressed in the different capacity calculation methodologies, which are all, uh, I think, in the approval process with the regulators, or they have been approved, most of them. So I think that's also a good uh, and solid ground for, for the further development of, of the methodology and also for the provision of data and transparency. Very good. Uh, Jens, I don't know if you have uh, something to add on that, on what's the, how the RSC and future RCC can, can help further on this, on this transparency? I might add one thing, and that is uh, that we are, we are basing our flow-based capacity calculation on a uh, regional forecast for, for the next day's um, net demand. And uh, this is developed now in, in parallel so that, that we have a, a, uh, the best basis for, for, for the data model uh, and for the flow-based capacity calculation actually to, to, to start the, uh, the, the market uh, allocation. Uh, because as Martin mentioned, then, then uh, the, uh, the models, they are, they are linear, whilst uh, our world is nonlinear. 
So therefore, when you linearize, then it's important to start the right point. Uh, and that's where the, the regional forecasting is uh, extremely important in, in that respect. Uh, so we, bear, we, are, we are preparing a, a um, regional forecast of the net demand, as we call it, um, which will be the starting point for the, for the flow-based capacity calculation. And this is based on input from the TSOs, of course, uh, for forecasting, but then uh, we are looking at, um, with all those data input, what similar days uh, would have this picture of forecast. And with getting those similarities, we see, okay, then the most probable flow with these input will be this picture that we might have had three weeks ago in a Thursday evening or whatever, which just complies in the best picture with all the data forecasts we get in for this particular hour of tomorrow. And that's, that's I think, a major step forward also in getting the right calculation. And of course, with the target of getting the optimal calcul uh, say f uh, capacity, the optimal capacity to the market. Because the optimal capacity to the market might even be lower than the NTC that we are calculating today. But that remains to be seen how uh, that develops. But we have to say that, that our target is to get the optimal capacity taking security of supply and the most efficient use of the grid into consideration. Thanks a lot for that, um, Anne. Um, the CP indeed foresees much more reporting for, from the RCCs to NRAs on, on transparency aspects. What, what do regulators expect from, uh, from RCCs uh, on that, these transparency issues? More generally, I think that we really welcome the, the SEP uh, rules on the RCCs. And I think the independence from uh, the TSOs is actually good because that uh, allows the RCC to take a through regional uh, perspective and I think that is good. Although we have had uh, a long uh, tradition here in the Nordics for voluntary cooperation which has been of course very fruitful. But still I think this is taking it one step further. Um, and, and as they are a legal entity, they can also be regulated, of course, <laughs> and they can be held liable. So they actually interact with us in, in that respect. But we will still, the methodologies will still come from the TSOs, actually. So it, we will interact uh, as we are used to with the TSOs on the methodologies. So that will be no change there. But, uh, but of course, I mean, this is taking more a regional perspective on things, and uh, we we really think th this is a good good thing, um, actually. And um, uh, we can actually, I think, impose fines. I don't know how the, how that will work. I used to work for the competition authority, so I I know everything about imposing fines, but but not in this area. So this is the methodologies and and the regions are still, of course, to be chiselled out. I would be surprised if we won't have a Nordic region, but but who knows? Um, and then, of course, the methodologies on on how the RCC should really work uh, in in detail will will still yet to be to be decided upon, of course, as as any other methodology. Um, I would like maybe to move on. This has been uh, mentioned by um, by Søren on on this famous seventy percent uh, threshold uh, that has been introduced in the in the clean energy package, in particular in the electricity regulation, that uh, yeah foresees that by twenty. 25 at the latest, uh, at least 70 percent of uh, cross-border capacity should be allocated to the market. But and of course, capacity calculation performed in an optimal manner will be uh, instrumental to achieve such a such a threshold. But maybe I I, I leave the the floor to Elaine on that, uh, who is like has been following all those discussion on the 70 threshold very closely, to explain us exactly what is it about and what it, what it imply. Um, thanks, Charlotte. Indeed, I think it's important when we start to look at this 70% question and what does it mean. It, I think we need to um, really look at the legal framework within which it applies. So this is about cross-border trade within the single market in the EU. 
Um, and the legal treatment of electricity is that electricity is a good, it's not a service. And, and this has been confirmed by, by several um, court judgments over the, over the last number of decades. So I think this is the first thing to bear in mind, that we're trading within the single market. Um, and what comes with that, if you're trading goods within the single market, there are some principles that apply that come directly from the treaty. So the principles of the maximization of the capacities for trade at the border, and also non-discrimination of internal versus cross-zonal flows. And these are two principles that were already in the previous electricity regulation, so 714 2009, and now they're also in, in the recast electricity regulation. So I would say that in a sense, these have always been there. And um, what this 70% does now, it puts a number on principles that have always been there. And I think this has drawn attention to these principles as well. Um, but of course, these principles, there have been um, competition cases over the years as well that has also drawn attention to them. So the Svenska Kraftnack case and also the one from December um, last year with, with, with um, the, the German-Danish interconnectors. So, um, I would say that the legal treatment is very important in terms of trying to understand where, where this came from. So you have these two principles of non-discrimination and, and the maximization of capacities for trade. Of course, what's traded in the end um, depends on what the market participants use. Um, but what's offered for trade should be a, as much as, as possible. Um, and of course, what comes with this is that we're dealing with a very complex technical system and we need to make sure that the system is always operated within the, within the security limits as well. And so the best way to understand the 70% is actually to look at the 30%. What does this 30% cover? Actually, during the negotiations, um, I suggested changing it to 30%, but it was a bit too late in the process because I think it's easier to understand it that way. The 30% is what's for the reliability margin and loop flows. It's so both will be bundled into that. And then the rest, the 70% goes to the regional RSC now, so the capacity calculator. In the future, it will go to the regional coordination center where the N minus one standard will be applied. And that will be applied at a regional level. So although we have this 70% that would go for, for coordinated capacity calculation, it will never end up being 70%. It will be whatever is needed in order to satisfy the N minus one security standard. And I think that's a really important point. Um, it's a bit more complex for NTC borders, um, but uh, maybe it's a, it's a bit, um, um, it, it's maybe too technical to, to go into that now. So I would say that the best way to understand it is to look at what the 30% covers, um, and um, then the, the, the rest kind of flows from that. And I think it's these principles as well of non-discrimination and maximization of capacities for trade is very important. And this is essentially putting a number on the principles that were already in legislation for a long time. So, Ren, I see you, you want to, to react. Yeah, I, I, I just, I'm, I'm very happy to learn about the legal stuff here. Um, I think what is also important is to, to pay attention to the technical stuff. Um, and uh, if we provide capacities that are uh, not resulting in physical flows, uh, but just in a lot of hassles with TSOs and in control centers, uh, something is wrong. Perhaps not with the legal stuff, perhaps not with the technical stuff, but then with something else. And I think it's important to say that we as TSOs, we are uh, indeed committed uh, to maximize the flows on the grid. That's actually where the grid creates value. It's not by building it, it's by uh, serving flows. So, so we are definitely committed uh, and also want to go constructive into this dialogue about the 70%. But I think uh, it, should be, uh, it should also be noted how much of this capacity is actually physical available and how much is just uh, financial arrangements. Uh, because it's not, in my view, really uh, open for trade if we counter trade before the fiscal delivery. So I think uh, bearing in mind the physics uh, also in the next uh, steps is extremely important. I hope that we, with the implementation of uh, good uh, capacity calculation methodologies on a regional basis, can cater for this. But I think from a TSO perspective, this is uh, indeed uh, extremely important to pay attention to uh, in addition to all the legal stuff. Anna, I saw you. I yes, saw thank you. you. Uh, Svenska Kraftnet was mentioned, my colleague <laughs> sitting here. Uh, 
yes, bidding zone configuration is really, really important. That also contributes to, to correct price signals, actually. Uh, so that's important. Um, uh, that being said, as I said earlier, it's important that we have as much uh, capacity possible uh, on the interconnectors because that's a way to cope with more renewables. We did a lot of simulation a couple of years ago uh, at my authority and saw that we were actually sort of saved by good bidding zone configuration, the hydro and having a, a very high interconnection ratio. So we have to utilize those interconnection connectors. 70% uh, is not a ceiling. Um, I'm not going to fiddle around with 30% or 70%, but it's not a ceiling. We have a regulation in place already since 2009 saying that as much capacity as possible should be allocated on uh, the cross-border interconnectors. So this is uh, really important to, to remember. I think if it's easy or not to, to meet the criteria in the Nordics, uh, we as NRAs uh, will start a discussion with, with the, the, the TSOs here to understand if it's only a calculation issue, us not having flow best yet, or if it's a sort of a real capacity uh, issue that we, we cannot really meet the target. Uh, I hope it's more a calculation uh, thing, but uh, we we are want to enter into a dialogue with the TSO series to understand more on this. Um, thank you. I just want to to add to that fully fully agree and um, um, with with everything that you've said. And indeed, this seventy percent should not be a ceiling. Um, I think it's important to recognise that the result of the regulation, what's in there now, was a careful political compromise. Um, you won't see any 70% um, in the original Commission proposal. Actually, it was an idea of the member states um, to, to introduce this, this target. Um, and, and now we all, I think now it's everybody's regulation, so we all need to work together to implement it in the best way possible, bearing in mind that we need to make as much cross-border, as much capacity available for cross-border trade as possible. I think we need to keep the vision in mind as well. This is really about how do we make the system fit for the future, so where we have lots of renewables on the system, lots of variability, where, where interconnection can really work in a flexible way to support security of supply, but only if those interconnection capacities are, are well allocated and are well used. Um, the Commission spends quite a lot of money and on, on projects of common interest, on on trans-European networks and, and the TSOs and, and member states, we all spend um, billions of euros on these, these large infrastructure projects. I think the, the key thing that um, wanted to be achieved by the legislators as a result of these negotiations was that we use this infrastructure efficiently. And I think that's really a quick win that we can, we can hopefully get to make sure that the, the, the existing infrastructure is used as, as well as we possibly can. Thanks a lot. Uh, I don't know, Jens, Soren, if you want to, to compliment you, you started to, to touch upon indeed the, the challenges it can pose uh, for, for, for TSOs, for, for RCCs to implement, to implement the 70% threshold. Do you want to elaborate uh, further on that, maybe? Yeah. Um, I don't have too much to add on this, uh, but um, obviously we uh, will see two different uh, say regimes when we are talking about the NTC calculation and then we, we are talking about the flow based capacity calculation um, I do not expect the huge challenges when we are looking into the flow based capacity calculations in the Nordic area as I see it at the moment uh, we might be surprised but uh, that's our expectation uh, for the future and of course, for the for the uh, the short term NTC calculation, it remains to be seen how how this is uh, in detail uh, described to be to be uh, implemented. Um, there will, of course, be uh, a risk of uh, significantly additional uh, say security uh, analysis uh, incompatibilities that we will have to cope with. Uh, through remedial actions of, uh, of different sorts, that's what is done today. Um, but but um, I think we can we can manage that. But uh, it remains to be seen whether we have remedial actions available, and that's the security risk that we may turn into, and that of course will be be visualized with uh, examples because we need to have the remedial action available to be able to cope with that. 
Otherwise, we're running a significant risk, uh, or we're running into a significant risk. Yep. Yeah, just just add here, and I also think it's it's worth having the attention to that now we have these national processes on making making sure that the 70% is available. Uh, we have this famous uh, uh, build, split, or pay that you can choose yourself, uh, and um, or at least choose in uh, in together with your regulator. Perhaps uh, build needs time. Uh, bidding zone split is um, uh, is a cumbersome thing in some member states. We know, and uh, pay. Yeah, that's always possible if the physical resources are there, as as Jens mentioned. And then um, obviously the regulators uh, should should pay attention on who is paying the bill uh, for this pay. Uh, and I think this this uh, definitely needs to be uh, closely monitored. And I think I all would also like to, to stress the point, I think, that Augelund made here in the morning, that we also need regional cooperation between the regulators here, because purely national processes here will, uh, will definitely uh, lead uh, to a suboptimal result. And you want to, to react quickly on that? I just want to say that I totally agree. Uh, we need regional cooperation between the regulators. Uh, I also heard one stop shop uh, in the morning. Um, that is ACER, I guess, or the Commission. Um, that could be good. I mean, we now in the, in the ACER regulation, the, the so called all NRA decisions, the, the pan European methodologies are now decided upon by ACER. Of course, the border regulators, consisting of all, all the NRAs, uh, vote, but we have the two thirds majority there. Um, of course, it can be efficient to give things away to ACER, but if you are a region that uh, has let's say, that are quite efficient, you might lack efficiency and be sacrificed on the <laughs> least common denominator altar. That's something uh, that we, at least at my authority, discuss a lot because, uh, so it's normally good to agree on a regional level if you have a regional methodology. Um, and we, of course, try to do that. And we also want to discuss with the TSOs. That's why we meet the C CEOs tomorrow, actually here in, uh, in the, in, the, in these premises. So this is very important, of course, and to understand where we come from. We also understand that TSOs really struggle. There is a lot of methodologies, and some of them are running parallel, but I don't think we can be uh, uh, just put the, hand, the head in the sand. We need to, to, to just struggle on, and of course, uh, and implement. And we can't just pick and choose and do a CBA analysis on, on which one to take first. Unfortunately, we, we have to work in parallel, but we as NRAs, we, we, we try to be pragmatic here and, and try to find pragmatic solutions. So, so I hope next year also, the, the it, uh, not to, to have an old TSO panel, so some NRAs also, because it brings about dynamics. So that's, that's a takeaway from f to the organizers. Thanks a lot. Um, I think there is, uh, in order to leave uh, also a bit of uh, time for, for interaction with the room, there is still one, one topic I would like to, to discuss uh, in this panel. It's regarding the, the RCC challenging implementation timeline as per the, the, the clean energy package. Uh, R uh, RCC have to be uh, operational as of uh, 1st July 2022, and this will of course include uh, delivering capacity, uh, c coordinated capacity calculation. And um, the common grid model will be uh, a cornerstone of this capacity calculation at pan-European level. And based on the latest information we have regarding the delivery, we understand that full go-live delivery of the, this common grid model is expected towards the end of 2021. So it seems very challenging, like this six months before the delivery of the common grid model and the RCC being operational. I would be interested to hear the, the perspective of, of, of Soren and, and Jens maybe on, on this changing timeline and how do you, do you plan to cope with this and again how stakeholders can, can support. Yeah, I think uh, I can start by saying that the TSOs and NSOE are fully committed uh, to, uh, to, to deliver this uh, in time. Uh, unfortunately, we we have seen uh, delays uh, to some uh, some partial deliveries already, and the timeline is stressed. I think the robustness of the system is uh, definitely also important, paying in uh, having in mind the the importance that it will play. Um, 
if I could uh, really foresee the future, I would probably not work at a TSO. I will <laughs> at least, uh, yeah. Perhaps I, we are very good at foreseeing the future 10 years ahead, uh, but the traders are better at foreseeing the next six months. Uh, but um, I, I think definitely we will get this in place. Uh, it will be a major step forward for Europe. Uh, it will create a lot of value. And I think we should, um, we should just uh, keep on working as, as uh, fast as we can uh, on, on delivering this. Jens, we have, I don't know. I had, I had. I, I could add what, just one thing. Yeah. Um, when I'm presenting the status for the CEOs, this project has been in yellow the entire time, but it has not yet turned into red. <laughs> so uh, we're still on track. I had 45 in uh, for the end of my uh, of the session, so at least it leaves maybe a uh, time for five minutes uh, interaction with uh, with the audience. I don't know. We have to close. Okay. Apologies for that, because in my, in my understanding, we had at least five minutes left for, uh, for the discussion. But uh, if there is no time for, for final question, I would like to, to thank again Martin for the very good presentation and all the panelists for the very interesting uh, discussion. And uh, yeah, thank you very much.